America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> the Board of Selectmen regrets to announce the passing of Ed Mulligan. Ed served on the Zoning Board of Appeals from 1998 until his recent untimely death, serving as chairman from 2003. He was a valued, knowledgeable member of the Zoning Board, a great family man, and a very good friend to many. Would you please join the board in a moment of silence for Ed Mulligan. Thank you. Be seated. <clears throat> okay. First, under public announcements, we have an update on the Tricentennial Committee. And here to give us the update is Nancy Reed from the Tricentennial Committee. Good evening. Well, things are really coming to a peak with all kinds of great things that are being planned more and more will be coming your way. I'm here tonight to talk to you about commemoratives. We want you to know that if you haven't put an ad in our commemorative book, which is now up to at least 200 pages, you still have time. They have just extended the deadline to April 1st. So my suggestion is don't be an April Fool. Get that ad in soon. If you, um, it's $100 for a quarter page, $175 for a half page. These are all horizontal ads on uh, 8.5 by 11 size paper. A full page ad is $275. It doesn't have to be just businesses. It can also be maybe um, some you'd like to commemorate commemorate something in your family or just let people know you were here in 2012. So my next thing that I wanted to talk to you about is this very exciting DVD. <coughs> well, I think it's exciting because I like history. And in one half an hour, you can learn just about everything you want to know about the history of Abington right up to the present day. Thanks to Beth Anderson Godfrey, she has taken the play that she and her sister wrote way back in 1976 and has brought it up to date and has um, had it narrated, has taken new pictures, and in a half an hour it <coughs> is the most beautiful story of Abington with beautiful pictures. And those are selling for only $10. You can order it at any time, but we're not going to release them until until. June sometime because if we did that everybody would be making copies of everybody else's the quality wouldn't be as good and um, this is also a partial fundraiser for our committee so um, we'll be having them available probably after the parade this is the cover of this little CD that they were working with and one thing led to another and the next thing you know they came up with this beautiful Oops, sorry. I don't know if you can see it, but um, it's got the strawberries, which is so important to Abington, as well as a few other old scenes from Abington. So I think um, it would make a nice addition to anybody's family room or um, hallway or any room. These are selling for $20, and you can pay up front and get them right away or within a week or so after they're printed and mounted on this um, beautiful um, mat board. So um, if you're interested in any of these or any of our other commemoratives, if you go to the uh, lobby of the town hall, there's all kinds of order blanks there. And um, you can also go to the website with all the, we'll have all the information for you too. So hopefully you're going to get excited about these items and want to have one for your own. And, and at the next meeting, we'll bring you some more information about what's happening. Thank you, Nancy. Thank Thanks, you. Nancy. Thank you much. Mr. Chairman, if I could. Sure. This time. Um, the Abbott Historical Commission 
held a commemorative flag design contest, and the winners are on the outside of this, in the second floor of the town hall. The winners in the first, second, third place are on the wall. So it's kind of a neat design, and, and the winning flag will be in the parade on St. Patrick's Day. So I just want to make note of that. Thank you, Kenny. Anything else on the public announcements? No? All right, next on the agenda, <clears throat> we have a presentation of an Eagle Scout proclamation. Uh, we have with us here tonight a very ambitious, gifted young man who has achieved the distinct rank of Eagle Scout. And the Board of Selectmen would like to present him with a proclamation. Uh, now, before I read the proclamation, Ryan, could you please take the podium? And you can say as little or as much as you want. We just, we just, want, we just want people to know, know who I'm reading about. <clears throat> and the proclamation reads, Whereas, on January 15, 2012, Ryan Hatch attained the rank of Eagle Scout while a member of Abington Boy Scout Troop 41. Whereas the rank of Eagle Scout is bestowed to only a small number of scouts and is the highest rank obtainable in scouting, requiring many years of hard work and dedication. Whereas Ryan Hatch took on the task of cleaning up and re-landscaping the veterans' lots at Mount Vernon Cemetery for his Eagle Scout project, and in so doing, honoring the memory of the men who fought to provide the freedoms we enjoy. Whereas Ryan Hatch took great pride in this undertaking, giving back to the community, exhibiting organizational and leadership skills. Whereas the Abington Board of Selectmen, on behalf of the residents of the town of Abington, wish to congratulate Ryan Hatch on his outstanding achievement of becoming an Eagle Scout and on the completion of his project, cleaning up and re-landscaping the veterans' lots at Mount Vernon Cemetery. His hard work, dedication, and commitment <laughs> are recognized by his community with pride. Signed the Board of Selectmen, Chris Aiello, R. Andrew Burbine, Vice Chair, Kevin Donovan, Kenneth M. Coyle, and Michael W. Frame. Thanks, Ryan. All right. Are there any further, any other public announcements, Kenny? I have one. Um, as most people are well aware, myself and Andy Burbine are members of the Lions Club, and this Saturday night we're having a big St. Patrick's Day comedy night at the Legion. Um, for more information, you can contact myself or any other Lion. Um, Abington's own Paul Keenan will be performing along with three other comedians. It's very reasonable, $20, so hopefully we can get a full house again. Thank you, Kenny. Okay, if there's no other public announcements, uh, we can move on. Uh, at 6.30, we have Seth Pickering, a Green Community Coordinator, here to give us a presentation on becoming a Green Community. Mr. Pickering, whenever you're ready, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, John. Chairman, um, members of the board, thanks very much for having me. Appreciate the invite. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. I think it's right there. The lights on.
Okay, well again, thank you very much for having me. I'll run through this as quickly as I can. I've got about 24 slides. I will be quick, um, knowing that I'm the first one um, tonight. We want to be conscious of everybody's time. Um, my name is Seth Pickering. I'm with the Department of Energy Resources, Green Communities Division, and I'm your regional coordinator down here in the Southeast region. I work out of the Mass DEP office in Lakeville, um, so I'm close by. And one of the things I want to make sure that everybody knows uh, after my presentation is that I'm available um, if you need me. Okay, um, just quickly, uh, the Green Communities Division was created um, when the Green Community Act, Communities Act was passed back in 2008. Um, and the Green Communities Division's mission is to be uh, the hub for all energy-related uh, issues uh, that have to do with municipalities. Um, so basically, when, we, when I go out and talk to uh, the 84 cities and towns that I have here in the Southeast region, um, this is, this is the message that we try to get across in terms of what it really means to become green as, as a community. Um, try to establish an energy committee, uh, have an energy officer if you can. Um, you need to establish an energy baseline for your municipal buildings, your schools, all your street lights and vehicles. Um, any energy audits that can get performed by uh, either your uh, uh, utilities uh, or through um, capital planning uh, would be really helpful. Uh, and then implementing the measures that those audits that would identify. Uh, and also basically changing behaviors, making people more aware of the fact that it's important to do things like shut off lights and computers, really small things, anything helps, uh, and also exploring renewable energy opportunities. Uh, we have a number of different uh, resources that we can bring to bear here for the town, whether you decide to pursue a Green Communities designation or not. And these are just a few of them. Mass Energy Insight System is a free energy tracking system that's available to all the municipalities here in the Commonwealth. Uh, it's a very powerful tool. I'll go into a little more detail. Um, Abington has signed up and had authorization, um, but to really fully implement it, uh, we're going to have to do a little bit more work, I think, with um, John and some other members of, uh, uh, of the town. Um, there's the grant program, um, whereby if you become designated as a green community, you qualify for grant monies that you can use for energy efficiency measures. Um, we also have the municipal energy efficiency program, where we would work uh, with the program administrators, which here would be uh, NSTAR Gas and Electric, um, to get them to come in, um, do some energy audits on your different municipal buildings, your schools, um, this building, the library, um, whichever ones uh, would be the best ones to target. Uh, and so you can get some, uh, get an idea of where you might be able to save energy in those buildings. Um, we can provide contractual technical assistance if you want to get into performance contracting. Um, we've implemented some stimulus money programs uh, for the federal government. Uh, and here are uh, some of the contact sites, the website, uh, and also an, an email listserv that will give you automatic updates um, if you get on our list. Okay. If if Abington wants to pursue becoming a green community, the five criteria the town has to meet. The first two are zoning related. Um, you have to establish as of right siting um, for an, an option. You have options in terms of what you want to do that for. It can be for research um, and development of al renewable or alternative uh, energy, uh, generation of renewable or alternative energy, and or manufacturing. You can do any of the three. You don't have to do all three. So you can do one, two, or more. Um, you have to have an expedited permitting process in place for anything that is applicable um, to criteria number one. Um, the third thing you need to do is, as a town, you have to establish an energy baseline for the whole municipality. That Mass Energy Insight tool is a great um, tool to use to do that. So you would be looking at all your buildings, all your operations, all your vehicles, uh, everything across the board, and get a baseline for what the uh, energy consumption is here in town. And then once you establish that baseline, um, we would assist you to uh, generate a 20% reduction plan uh, over a five-year period from that baseline. You'd have to put into place a fuel-efficient vehicle purchase policy. That would have to be adopted by you as the select board and also uh, by the school uh, department and school committee. Uh, and the fifth one is the requirement uh, of uh, adoption of the stretch code here in Massachusetts, which is a, approximately 10 to 20% more energy-efficient building code um, than the base energy code here in Massachusetts right now. So those are the five criteria. The town would have to meet all five and then apply to the department uh, for a designation. Uh, this is just briefly identifies the steps. We're already here meeting with uh, the select board. Um, so uh, as you'll see, um, uh, the things that would have to be done 
after you after uh, I come and talk to you is whether or not you want to decide to pursue it, uh, and then we can move forward. Uh, for the first criteria, um, uh, I don't want to get into too much detail because I know it's in your in your in your packages also. But you, you do have options. Um, you can do renewable or alternative energy generation, uh, or the renewable or alternative energy research and development, uh, or manufacturing. Uh, if you already have industrially zoned land here in town, uh, a lot of towns uh, choose to modify uh, their zoning bylaws to do as of right for for uh, manufacturing or R and D. Um, as opposed to doing generation. If you might have a suitable site um, for some type of uh, renewable generation, whether it be wind, solar, uh, something to that effect, uh, you can do it in a zoning overlay district uh, and, and take care of that uh, criteria, um, number one, for generation. Uh, Rockland's looking into it now. Situate has done it uh, nearby, and there are a number of other towns um, that uh, I can put you in contact with, uh, if you're interested, uh, that are doing it. Uh, there are size requirements. Uh, onshore wind, uh, you have to do a minimum of a 600 kilowatt a unit. That's a pretty good size unit. Um, if you've been down towards Mass Maritime, the unit there is a 660 megawatt, uh, kilowatt unit. Um, the ones in Kingston, if you've seen them, are two megawatts. Those are about, you know, a little over three times bigger than the minimum requirement. Uh, and the one over in uh, Situate is about a 1.8, so that's three times as big. Um, so you can do wind, you can do solar volta uh, photovoltaic, a 250 kilowatt system requires probably a little over an acre of land uh, in terms of the size for the number of panels that you'll need plus the supporting infrastructure. Uh, you could do biomass, combined heat and power, it's an option, uh, really haven't had anybody doing that uh, and we haven't been able to take advantage of ocean wave or tidal yet. Whatever you adopt for criteria one, you have to have uh, an expedited permitting process for that. That means all the local permitting, uh, all the Abington control permitting would have to have a process in place that was a 365 day window. Um, it's, it doesn't mean automatic approval uh, if you don't meet that requirement, but that's what needs to be uh, in place here in town. Um, if you already do that, uh, as a matter of course, and your, uh, and your town council uh, wrote a letter uh, vouching for that, that would satisfy this requirement also. Okay, criteria three um, is uh, it's quite a bit of work. Truthfully, um, you basically calculate a, a municipal baseline for all your municipal buildings and schools, all your vehicles, uh, and any street lights, traffic lights that you own here in town. Again, we, we recommend that you get into using the Mass Energy Insight system to do this. Um, so it's it's a comprehensive look at all your energy use here in town, and that's just for the municipal. It's not for any of your res residents. Uh, the Mass Energy Insight tracking tool, uh, again, very powerful. You can run all sorts of reports. You can do baselines. You can identify your most energy um, inefficient and efficient buildings. Uh, another graphic on that, you can create the comprehensive uh, energy reduction plan using the baseline that this generates and then looking at the buildings um, that would be your most energy intensive, you know, so that you can target them um, to make your best choices for reducing energy consumption. Uh, criteria four is a fuel efficient vehicle purchase policy. Uh, truthfully, uh, the way things are going today, most of the vehicles um, are exempt from this policy. Anything with a gross vehicle weight over 8,500 pounds, so any of your fire, uh, DPW, uh, your police cruisers are all exempt. Uh, they're really administrative in nature, and what it means is that moving forward, so if there's no look back. It doesn't say that you would have to replace um, vehicles in your existing fleet, um, but as you move forward, you would have to use vehicles that conform to this policy. Um, and it does not, you know, there's no mandate for hybrids or anything like that. It basically asks that you, that you uh, conform to a certain duty cycle and mile per gallon rating for the vehicles as you purchase them as part of your capital plan. Fifth criteria is uh, um, most of this wording comes right out of the Green Communities Act. What it really comes down to, and the recommended way to comply with this, is the adoption of the Stretch Energy Code, um, which is an optional uh, part of the Energy Building Code here in Massachusetts. It's approximately 10 to 20 percent more energy efficient than the base code. Um, and uh, the method that we recommend uh, from DOER for adoption is uh, by a general bylaw here in town. So, two of the five criteria um, can require town meeting votes. Um, two-thirds majorities usually are required for uh, the zoning 
um, if this is proposed as either a general bylaw or an article, we've had other, we've had towns that have proposed it as simply as an article on the on the warrant. Um, it's a, it's a simple majority. Okay, so uh, we are up to 86 green communities. You can see my region is a little bit whiter than I'd like it to be. Uh, so uh, if we can get a few more, it'd be great. Um, but we've got a few of your neighbors that 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 are in the fold. Um, you know, Hanover, Situate, Kingston are all close by. Bridgewater just came on board in the last round, uh, and Easton's not too far off. Um, uh, they're all doing it. Um, so uh, if you have any questions, you can always feel free to reach out um, to your peers in those towns and see how it's working out for them. Seth, if I, if I could, sure. if you could just make a comment. And I, yep. I guess uh, as far as the communities itself, I know when uh, the commissioner and I were speaking, a town like Lancaster, who geographically is in the, the middle of the state, but economically is more of a working class community. And yep. I believe they're a, a green community, are they not? Uh, Lancaster, yep, I can see them right there near Shirley. So I guess that there's a broad spectrum you go from, you know, yeah. to the post, if you will. Yes, and uh, really, um, I guess, and thanks, thanks for reminding me, because that was in your note, uh, asking me to make sure that there's really no clear demographic here, to be honest with you. It goes from the smallest of towns out in the western part of the state, uh, all the way to uh, Boston, which is the biggest city. Um, so all different types of, of towns, uh, uh, irrespective of um, you know, whether they're uh, working class towns or um, academic towns, uh, you know, across the board, and, and population wise, there's, there's, a, there's a big, big uh, swing between the smallest and the largest. So nothing really fits um, you know, categorically. Um, and again, we'll, some of your neighbors uh, are already there, and some others are, are working towards it. Uh, and this next uh, slide shows you some of the stretch code communities. So there are 86 green communities, and there are 105 communities that have adopted the stretch code so far. We're probably going to have a few more uh, that adopt the stretch code um, here in the spring um, town meeting season. But you can see there's a couple um, close by. Pembroke and Hanson uh, are on the list here. Uh, Lakeville uh, also. Um, so we're hoping that um, they will be applying in the spring for green community status. Rockland's also seriously considering uh, trying to come on board uh, in the spring. Uh, they're getting their town meeting more in articles uh, in order to, uh, to try to do that. So you, you've got some neighbors that are very close by that are, that are trying to get into this too. Energy efficiency. Uh, again, I'm going to just touch on this briefly, but, but what I want to make sure that, that everybody knows is that we will um, help you work with your utilities here in town to get them to come and give you the services you deserve uh, as a municipality to get as many of your buildings and operations, whether it be um, your school buildings, um, your, your public works, um, you know, whether it's your water treatment plant or your wastewater treatment plants. Um, looked at and, and audited so that you can get an idea of where you may be able to uh, be able to be saving some some good energy money. Uh, and you can see these are the towns and cities that have taken advantage of it. And you can see um, that we have not had the privilege of working with Abington yet uh, on energy efficiency stuff. So um, I'll be in touch with John and we'll see what we can do about moving forward with that. Um, if you were interested uh, in maybe doing um, energy management services, uh, you know, I'm not sure whether or not you guys have looked at uh, ESCO here in, in Abington at all, um, but if you were, we can help you with the technical assistance part of the uh, contractual uh, obligations. We can't advise you in terms of what, whether or not you're getting a good deal or not, but in terms of um, the statutory requirements of what, <coughs> what need to be in your contracts, we can help you out with. Okay, again, we really recommend that uh, uh, you use Mass Energy Insight, get signed up, authorized, and, and use it. You can do all these different things, benchmark, identify, um, measure and verify are the three big things it'll do. Uh, it'll run all sorts of reports that are easy for people to understand. You know, it takes numbers and puts them in graphic, uh, in graphic representation so they're a lot easier to understand. Uh, and then contacts. Um, I'm your regional contact right here in Lakeville. Grew up in Middleborough, know the area. Used to come over here and play Abington and baseball and so, uh, uh, football uh, back in the day, a long, long, long time ago. Uh, and so there's my contact uh, info. 
uh, and Megan Sardi is my director, and as Mr. Donovan knows, uh, Mark Sylvia is uh, our commissioner. So I think that's it on my presentation. Um, briefly, if I can have about three more minutes, because um, this is the type of thing that really helps um, your board, I think, understand you know, what it really means to become designated. Uh, as a for instance, Easton got $168,000, almost $169,000 uh, as part of their, their grant. Uh, they're going to replace the town office boiler. They're going to replace the boiler and fire station rooftop heating and cooling units. Um, the water division is going to replace the garage heaters. The middle school is going to do energy efficient uh, parking lot lights. And the high school is going to get a, a big lighting upgrade. Uh, and their paybacks uh, usually run anywhere between two to six or eight years. Um, so they'll be saving a lot of money um, right up front. Hanover got uh, almost $149,000. They did work on some of their older schools uh, in the heating systems. Um, they replaced the town hall boiler. Um, they replaced fire station doors at the headquarters in, in, uh, in Hanover, uh, and they're going to save quite a bit of money on that too. Kingston, um, the library and the Kingston Elementary School um, both got um, uh, energy management systems upgrades. Um, they got $163,528 from us, and they leveraged that with incentives and rebate money that they got from NSTAR. Um, which is really the, that's really the, uh, the best way to try to go about this. So, so you know, we can get into a, a, a partnership where we're working with you and have National Grid come in, do the audits, identify where you may be able to do energy efficiency and conservation. They will identify how much money they will contribute uh, in terms of incentives and rebates. You get designated as a green community. Um, what Kingston did was they took $163,000 they took about $95,000 that they get from NSTAR. They combined those things to do a bunch of projects, and the payback uh, on that was just a little over two years. So um, once that two-and-a-half-year period is over, the town is saving about $100,000 a year um, at today's present energy costs, you know, moving into the future. So um, it doesn't take long, you know, if you can make this really work, uh, you know, hand-in-hand uh, hand, uh, to... To, for the town to see some significant savings over time. I think that's it for me. So I'll be happy to take questions. I know time is short. Um, Would someone like to hit the lights, please? Thanks. Any questions for Mr. Pickering? Seth, all this information is available on your website? On the website, yep. And um, feel free to reach out, um, call me, um, send me an email. I'll get, I'll get back to you. Um, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of information there. Um, but uh, again, uh, I met with John. I was surprised, John. It's been a lot longer than I, yeah, I know, than I more. thought. Um, but um, uh, I'll come up anytime, you know, in terms of uh, when and how you need to meet. Be happy to, to do it. And I think one of the first things we'll try to coordinate is getting National Grid um, in and talk to them about getting some audits done for you through the Mass Save program, which is that's that's free. You know, that's, that's it, it's technically free, but it's like not. Um, you know, you pay into the renewable energy charges and the efficiency charges on your electric bills. So we'll get them here and, and, and make sure they, they're giving you guys a level of service that you deserve as a town. Thank you, Seth. Okay. I have, Seth, I have one question, too. If people on TV want to go online to find out more information about this, where would they go? They should go to uh, mass.gov, uh, D-O-E-R, and then, and then just do a search for green communities. All right. Very good, sir. Thank, Thank you, you very you, much. Sir. Thanks for having me. Appreciate and, it. And maybe if uh, Susan is chairman of the Sage Committee, maybe if you two could chat. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks again. Thank you. <laughs> Jim, whenever you're ready. You ready? I'm ready if you are. Next on something. the agenda, we have Jim Dombrowski uh, request permission to host an Environmental Awareness Day at Griffin's Dairy. Jim? Jim Dombrowski, member of Griffin's Dairy Group. Uh, recently, I had a nice opportunity of meeting with a young lady out on Griffin's Farm who owns and operates New England Reptile and Birds of Prey. We ended up walking the farm, and she offered us a program. And if you've ever been to some of the sportsman shows, and some of the big home shows and things like that, she puts on an excellent educational program, basically dealing with birds of prey and things of this nature. So she's offered us a free program. 
We've dubbed it environmental awareness because I have a couple other companies such as a solar company that has expressed interest in setting up a display. This will be an open air event. In other words, if it rains, it's going to be canceled. So we're hoping for good weather, but just going to be setting up displays and passing out literature. That's, fine. What table That's pretty much on? basic. That'll be April 21st from 12 o'clock to 4 o'clock. It's a short event, but it's just, you know, four hours in the afternoon. We're going to be trying to get as many people as we possibly can to set up displays of various environmental aspects. I don't know if I can get the DEP involved, uh, USDA, Soil Conservation Service, solar companies, whoever is interested in showing up, pass it on information besides Myla and her program. And she will put out a flight demonstration. Okay. Which is Where would you do we, it to? Yeah, the parking lot? Right in the very parking lot, yeah. We wanted to use an A at the facility, so I don't know if you want to pass those Sure, on. I would. She is licensed, so if you need proof of insurance, uh, she can provide it to the town. But she's done this for, you know, various schools. I believe she has been in the Abington High School prior. But she does promise to bring out some very interesting birds for us. Now, those of us that know the farm know that years ago there used to be an owl that used to hang around the barn. It was a great horned owl. She promises to bring the great horned owl out with her. It's not endangered or anything of that nature, but she promises to bring one out. Thanks. Um, this requires a vote of the board. Just, sure. just a couple yeah. of questions. This is for free? Or yes, this is a free event. It's not going to cost anyone anything. And the first one would be just this one lady with the birds and the... She will be basically the, the feature attraction. Uh, we do have a gentleman from a solar company who has contacted me, said he would be interested in setting up a display. Uh, I haven't, you know, gotten responses from others, but I have about five or six other people or other interests who are interested in setting up displays and passing out literature. And possibly, we can possibly get Seth to give us some literature to pass out on that for the people. The, ba the basic theme behind it is get environmental awareness out to the people, educate them. And I think Griffin's Deer is a very unique location to have one of these types of events because it's the only area in town that has an open meadow. Maybe you might want to talk to some of the SAGE committee members. Uh, well, well, I plan to invite SAGE, the Board of Health, and the Conservation Commission to answer any questions on the environment. Or in you know, the particular recycling, all the things they have to do with the, env the environment, all aspects. What was the date again, Jim? April 21st from 12 o'clock to 4 o'clock at the site of Griffin's Dairy. Would anybody care to make a motion? Eight, eight, what is it, the time again? 12 o'clock to 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and it is a free event. Won't cost you a penny. Cost me, but it won't cost you. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'll move we approve authorization for April 21st from noon to 4 p.m. at the site of Griffin's Dairy uh, with the provisions that um, this individual provides an insurance certificate naming the town as an additional insurer. Yep. Okay. We have a motion. No, a second. We have a second. Any further discussion? I just want to make sure that some areas up there, the old barn, they had the fire. I'm just concerned that we can cut rope some areas off so that you know, we don't... Uh, It'll be the, the parking lot on the other side where all the milk trucks used to be mm -hmm. in that section there. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Expect to see you all there. We'll be there. Thanks, Jim. All right. <clears throat> Next on the agenda, we have discussion on the proposed amendments to the personnel bylaw known as the Classification and Salary Plan, adopted at the in an adjourned session of the June 16, 1997 Annual Town Meeting. John, would you care to open this discussion? Um, actually, the, this is the same bylaw that was uh, previously proposed and was defeated at Town Meeting. Yep. Um, there was some additional changes that we had made um, where we had replaced the Executive Secretary um, with the Town Manager language throughout the um, balance of the article which is approximately uh, 20 19 pages long and we had you know had basically changed the executive secretary to town manager as well as some of the other language that uh, the board had requested there was a subcommittee of the board that was established to go through this with the town manager. And what you have, I think, before you is the 
red line copy of, of that. John, is this a public hearing? Yes. All right, let me open the hearing just for, for uh, just to be proper here. The Board of Selectmen will hold a public hearing on Monday, March 12, 2012, 6.45 p.m. in the Carter Hearing Room, Town Hall, 500 Glenowix Way, regarding the proposed amendments of the personnel bylaw known as the Classification and Salary Plan, adopted in the adjourned session of the 16th, 1997 Annual Town Meeting. I'll entertain a motion to open the hearing. So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. John? I think that's that's about all I had to say about Okay. It. And uh, it's going to be on the warrant again? That's correct. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? I'll, I'll take questions. I'll make it. Go ahead, Harry. The question from here is, I understand that the copy that was distributed to the boards and the uh, department heads a short while ago has been amended again. There's a newer copy in the draft warrant. Is that correct? There is a copy in the draft warrant. The only the only difference um, in the one that was distributed a week ago was that I went through it and, and changed in the uh, some of the pages that did not. For example, page 19 under military leave, it, it under the old copy it had executive secretary and was changed to town manager. Um, Basically, so everybody knows. All which the purpose of this article is to bring the uh, personal, personnel bylaws in line with the charter. We've been operating as is for 10 years. We don't really have to change it. It doesn't have to be changed. We're, this is just a matter of housekeeping. Because right now we have a, a, a charter and a personnel bylaw that they're not necessarily in sync. So. That's correct. And That's uh, there were on page 18, there were two changes from executive secretary mm -hmm. to town manager. On page 17, there was one change from executive secretary to town manager. Um, and I think the rest of it um, was in line with what was presented prior. Is that copy available now? Yeah. Yes. Where? I'll make you a Can copy. you make it? Make give Henry everything he wants. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Absolutely. Okay. Henry DiCarlo, 187 Central Street, and uh, representing the Board of Library Trustees on this issue. As you know, I spoke up against this at town meeting, uh, not because I wasn't in favor of it. As a matter of fact, I am, and I can speak for my board, and we are very much in favor of updating this bylaw. But at town meeting, among other things, it stopped at article, I think, uh, paragraph 9.3, if I recall. Um, the one that was distributed a few weeks ago also stopped at that paragraph. There's paragraphs, there's sections 10, 11, 12 in there. So. I understand that the new copy that's available today, or, or just in the last couple of days, has cha has those changes in it, has cleaned up most of that language, and that's a good thing. And I'm very much in favor of this bylaw. I don't want it to be seen as opposed to it, but I'm in favor of doing it once and doing it right. Uh, so you know, that's my general overview on that. Uh, yeah. You know, so, so I don't want to be I, I don't want to yeah. be seen and as opposing fine. this. I want to be seen you know as do, well, doing it right. A uh, lot of people didn't understand it last yeah. time, and that's. Yeah. That's why I, I tried to make that point, but we, yeah, we we tried our best to explain it, but mm -hmm. it, it just was um, okay. a little too close to town meeting, and uh, people didn't really grasp. The it. unfortunate thing is that I just learned a, a couple of hours ago that there was a newer, cleaner version available uh, on the draft. I guess it's the draft of the warrant, and yeah, the that, warrant's draft. Yeah, but, and but that, it'll have the final version in the in right. the warrant, and that's a good thing because I think it picked up most of most of the smaller changes that we were looking to make sure were were corrected. Uh, we may speak on a couple of other things going forward here tonight, but but I just wanted to, to know that, and I want to make sure that you know that newer, updated version is available for people to take a look at it before we get too far along in the process. Well, that newer version will be part of the warrant. It'll be, yeah, there, it'll, be the, it'll be the final version that we decide on tonight. Yes. Be, will be mailed the, to every household. Yes. But the newer draft, I guess, has already improved dramatically because it does include the entire article, yeah. uh, the entire bylaw, which it didn't before. So I'll, That's I'll okay. defer to other people at this point. Okay, yeah. thanks, Henry. Here, here, um, Henry, here it is. Oh, thank you. 
It's, it's open to the floor. Mr. Donovan. It's still yeah. warm. It's still warm. <laughs> Mike Donovan, Vice Chair of the Sewer Commission. Um, the boards, the Sewer Department, uh, the Sewer Commission Board, our uh, thoughts on it is that we're not specifically precluded from any involvement with the personnel bylaws, but we're not included either. Um, and like you said, we're trying to bring the charter and the bylaws into perspective. Um, under the uh, charter, the town manager is not the appointing authority for the uh, sewer superintendent or the water. Um, and he is in the personnel bylaws doing the reviews of those positions. Whereas we'd like to be included along with that. We have no problem with the town manager being involved. Obviously he's going to be a part of the personnel board anyhow. Um, but we feel as though that the elected board should be a part of the process, and right now we're not. Where would you? What would you like to see change? Where Where would you like to see something added? Uh, four dash three, the ad administration of the classification plan. Uh, currently, the proposed change is each classified position is allocated to a given class as determined by the town manager. Maybe it should say by the town manager or the appointing authority, which would then bring all the boards that have their own appointing authority into line. Um, mm -hmm. And four dash three, in establishing a new class of positions and in the periodic classification reviews of the town manager shall ensure a job analysis is carried out to determine uh, central elements of a class of a job Again, the board should be involved with that process. Okay, well. Um, and then 4-3, uh, classification review. So 4-3, four, 4-3-A, three, four, three and 4-3-C. I believe it's D. I don't see a C in here in my copy. Okay, it says classification review. 4-3-D in my copy here, John. Oh. Right here on this one. Okay. So, okay. So, 4 So, essentially, D. just like I said, we just want to be included. That's, you know, okay. the mainstay. How, how much time do we have next week in, until this, this warrant has to be sent? Well, it has to be sent, I think. It has to go Wednesday. It has to go Wednesday. That's fine. In two days. Well, I think what we can do is just authorize the town manager to, to review it and make any appropriate changes he deems fitting and proper, and we can when we okay, set the so warrant. We can yeah, set the warrant and let, <laughs> let it I, fail a pass on its yeah, own. Yeah, I mean, the warrant's me. only in draft form. There is language mm -hmm. that is going to have to be cleaned up a little bit anyway, and that would be an administrative function that he'll be doing. So I think when we set the warrant, you know, obviously he's heard what the concerns are, and I'm sure... So we'll we, we will add for 4.3 town manager and appointing authority. <clears throat> After the word town manager, in four four three, uh, the same language under um, town manager. Uh, after the word reviews, the town manager um, and appointing authority. Well, like Kevin said, if you find areas that you feel as though that could be changed and bring us into line, mm -hmm. with the intent that you know. If it's an appointed uh, employee outside of your appointments, mm -hmm. then whatever board um, that should be involved would be. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Is, you're all you're all fine with that, John? No, oh, I don't have any problem with okay. any of it. Okay. Sure, Henry. Go ahead. Again, speaking for the library trustees, we would absolutely agree with that uh, change to four three with the sewer. Uh, I think that that would uh, would solve one of the uh, one of the issues we see. In addition, uh, in section five dash one, if I could refer to that, and I've got too many copies going here, so let's see if I can make sure I find it.
I think it would be useful there to uh, uh, this refers to town manager fixing the uh, compensation of all town employees and officers appointed by the town manager. I would suggest there that we might be able to use language saying the town manager or appointing authority shall fix the compensation of all town employees reporting to them, uh, something along that line. So, it, so those reporting to the town manager would, would still be affixed by the town manager and the appointing authorities would fix these salaries. Is this something you, you're comfortable with making these changes tonight, or do you want to meet with Henry next Monday? I, I don't. Well, the only you know concern we'll I have, this week, the, so. the only concern I have with it is the um, if the library board of trustees or if any of the appointing authorities fix a salary that let's say goes from fifty thousand to a hundred thousand, we I can't agree to that, or, or some right. number that does not that does not fit with the financial characteristics that the town is currently facing that you know maybe the library board of trustees would like to see a salary increase of x number of dollars but we can only afford y i would agree or the with same that. would be true for the um sewer commission well yeah. the sewer commission really is is a separate entity in some respects as it is it has its own revenue to offset its its expenses but the board of health board of health mm -hmm. is a you know another example so I, I don't know how comfortable i would feel towards that or whether the board if the board feels comfortable with it well, I, 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 have a, I have a suggestion the charter says that um and charter uses the language in consultation with the town manager so possibly there would say the town manager or the appointing authority in consultation with the town manager shall set the and because right now this, How about this if it just only says the town manager in consultation with the appointing authorities yeah. shall fix the compensation of all town employees and officers appointed by either the appointing authority or town manager within limits of staff. Yeah, I think we have to add that we have to include those who are not appointed by the town manager, and I think that's what we're trying to achieve. I think we would be comfortable with a consultation. Uh, I can't speak for this or folks. The way it works now, John, is that the, the board recommends a, a pay scale, and then you, as the um, chief financial officer or whatever, however you want, procurement officer, would then recommend it to town meeting also, right? Is that the way it works mm -hmm. now? Or okay. fit it in the budget. I right, mean, if exactly. it's something that the board, the appointing authority wants, we, we would try to fit it in the budget. but. Like I said, you know, as long as there's a check and there's a balance between the appointing authority and the town manager and vice versa. But going to your point, when you say the way it works now, the way this is worded, it only addresses those people who report to the town manager, the language that's here in front of us right now, and I think that's what we have to tweak slightly. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking for a major change here, but I think we need to provide the mechanism for those people who are not appointed by the town manager and use appropriate language to provide that mechanism. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have any problem with the board in consultation with the town manager, but I think the, town, the whole purpose we went to this town manager form of government is so he is right. in charge of things. He's the chief personal, yep. personnel officer for the town, and he's the one who has to be making yep. these decisions. I agree. As I say, though, the language right here now says oh, position, all positions appointed uh, reporting to the town manager. So you haven't addressed those other positions, and I think that's what I'm trying to achieve, Andy. I'm not, yep. trying, to, I'm not trying to... No, I understand. You yeah. know, gather, but, uh, but I want to make sure we've covered everyone. <coughs> In this that we need to cover, and it's just a, it's a small language change, but I think it, it can be worked in there properly. So that's section 5.1. Mm -hmm. Are we? Uh, so what are we? What are we going to use for language? I'm going to use uh, in, um, the town manager in consultation with with appropriate appointing authority that's shall fix the compensation for all that, town employees and officers. I think so. Um, either appointed by the town manager or the respective appointing authorities. And of course, there's always one more. It's like Colombo, right? There's just one more. <laughs> In section 6.2, um, we have a small uh, issue with the vacancy. Um, uh, let's see here. 6.2. Uh, 6, 6.2B. This is on, uh, I don't know, it looks like maybe page 12 of yep. this document. Yep, page 12. Okay, 6.2B, the advertising of the vacancy. Our situation may be, may be somewhat unique, but in my short discussion with the sewer folks today, um, we have access and we would advertise on library appropriate websites that, we, that, that our folks have a connection with. 
Um, I understand the sewer people might go out of DPD, uh, uh, DEP website. Um, so I'm not sure that, uh, and I think this may just be a simple place of adding the town manager, again, in, cons uh, in consultation with the appointing authority. She'll be responsible for, or the town manager and the appointing authority, she'll be responsible for advertising the vacancy. Again, for those vacancies that don't report to the town manager, there may be other mechanisms that we want to use here. Yeah. Is that all right with you, John? John? What's that? Is that okay? Is that agreeable? I, I, don't, I don't care. Mm -hmm. And the last thing is just a, a typo on the last page, I believe it is. which is what, page 19, and the newer material that we hadn't seen before. Uh, there is still a reference to section 10-13. And if I could get the pages to turn here. This is in 10-10 court time. And the second line from the bottom of section 10-10 refers to section 10-13 of this bylaw. And I refer you down to section 10-13. Hold on, hold on. What page are you on, Henry? <laughs> I'm on page 19. Okay, hold on. Is it 10, this 10, is 10 court time? In yeah. accordance with 10 It says it, it, the page shall be made in, this, in accordance with section 10-13. This is a typo from the old bylaw that carried forward. So we may want to fix that unless you want to add a section 10-13. No. <laughs> so should it be 10? Is it? I don't know where it's trying to point there. I was trying to figure that out. 10-2 10 10 2 possibly? A request for leave without pay shall first be made in accordance yeah, with 10-13. 10 10. So the request. It may be referring to section 10-2, John. Maybe that's where it should point. Yeah, it's 10-2. The only other uh, item that um, some of our board members have asked me to, uh, to address is the appointment of the personnel uh, board, the new reformed personnel board. The, was there a reason why the uh, town moderator does not appoint any of the positions to this new board? I know once appointed by the town manager, um, on the board of selectmen and one that's job. How, that's how it was written in the charter, correct? No, we, no? we decided purposely to do it this way. This is an advisory board to the town manager. Okay. It's not an advisory board to us or the town meeting, which is what generally the town manager, the town okay. moderator would have appointment over advisory boards to the town meeting. This and is an more, advisory it's board more specifically in nature than it is. Yeah. yeah. It's so. Okay. I, I was asked to ask that question. Mm -hmm. Those are the changes that we'd like to see, uh, and I think they all improve the product that we'll be putting in front of the town meeting. So hopefully, uh, we would do it. Yeah. We'll put them in. Thank you, Henry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you'll be get, getting up at town meeting and speaking in your favor of it. Absolutely. Once it comes out, once it comes out, if all the if all the eyes are dotted and the T's are crossed, the final product. Well, absolutely. No. So and, we don't and again, when I spoke on it before, I said I was in yes. favor of, of <clears throat> modifying this bylaw, but it has to be done properly yeah. and it has to be done correctly and it has to be done completely and leaving out three sections at the end of it yeah. didn't achieve that and leaving out the appointing authorities didn't achieve that thank you thank henry you. thanks i'll entertain a motion closing yeah. Henry. Right. well if you want to close it for the public body oh does, it, does anybody else go ahead tom <clears throat> tom dion 27 mulberry drive and i just really have a question to clarify and confirm i fortunately i don't have the document that you do in front of you, but my recollection at town meeting and looking at it, I don't know if it was a grievance process or some sort is. of a, well, I'm not going to be able to look okay. at it now, John, but. Um, grievance process? But there was some sort of a process where if there was a problem with an employee, there was there was a procedure to go through. I, as I recall, you went through a department head and then ultimately went up to the town manager to get resolved. But my sense was it ended at the town manager it didn't go to another level of the Board of Selectmen, and I guess I'm just looking to clarify and confirm that. Um, you know, would that be the position? Again, in other boards that I've served at, 
on, you know, with the assessors, if, if, if a property owner has uh, an issue with their property value, they come before the Board of Assessors, but if they're not um, in agreement with the Board of Assessors' um, rendering of a decision, they can appeal it, you know, to a higher authority, in this case, the Appellate Tax Board. I think in the school committee, if there's some sort of a grievance or of a, um, uh, a member of the community, or I think even staff, have an issue, there's a process, but the final arbiter is the, the school committee is the employer of record. Again, I'm, I'm just looking to clarify and confirm whether... The school committee is the... If, yeah. if an employee at the school department has a problem, the, the final Well, if a parent the does, and but, but I believe... we're talking about employees. Okay, well, I'm, even with an employee, I guess that would be my point. But is that how it is at the school committee? Um, I know with a parent, if they have a problem with their child, and I know of a property tax owner at the assessors, if they have an issue with the way the Board of Assessors has rendered a decision. These so my question for you is, as a board representing the community, should the selectmen have a final say on any sort of a decision that comes down with even an employee? My concern I'd to, is... I'd have to find the section. I, 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 we're trying to take the politics out of it. I, I, I wouldn't want politicians undermining the town manager when it came to a... A disciplinary action, but John, do you know what section he's talking about? Um, if it's suspensions and removal, Tom, it's nine two D, and it states an employee may su be suspended or removed from his or her position by the appointing authority in accordance with, and we've changed it. This is the change in accordance with Article seven fifteen of the town charter. So the charter provides us to how removals and suspensions transpire and that's what this does it's, and appeals also that okay but that, that's I, that's good information but my question is does it end with the town manager or does that it, it individual ends. have the right to to appeal to the board of selectmen as the representatives of the community to look at the so. situation I don't and think so no I and I don't think they can Tom on the basis if we go to the initial enabling section of the charter where it says the selectmen are there to make broad policy statements and, and are precluded from involving themselves in the day-to-day -day operations of the town. So with that said, the employee, the final decision maker in this case, you know, if they go up to the department head, is the town manager. If they're still aggrieved by that, they can still go to district court or superior court or wherever they want so to So that go. would be the, the mechanism. They would, have, they would still have their rights under the statute, but in terms of the charter itself, the charter specifically excludes the selectmen from yeah. involving themselves in the day-to-day -day operations. Right. Yeah, and, and I guess the... The, the, the reason for the question is if there's some sort of an employee dispute and as a representative of the community, if you felt that maybe it shouldn't go to the courts, maybe, maybe you should step in to correct a situation where I know we've had some in town, that before it goes to the next level and we get into legal costs and so on and so forth, that maybe it's better for, you know, the elected body here to, to jump in and well, the town, weigh in on it. It's Tom, really nothing political. Tom, when the town voted this new charter, I think the town made the determination that we're going to put that in the hands of the town manager. And that's where it rests. If, if <coughs> the town wants to make a different decision, they'd have to amend the charter to do that. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, in answer to your question, the other mechanism for that is if the employee were to file action, then the selectman by statute and charter would settle all lawsuits. So de facto, you'd be getting involved in it. But I think there has to be a process so that to the point where the selectmen aren't uh, involving themselves and reaching down into the departments. Now, if there becomes an issue, you know, again, if an employee feels as though that they've been wronged and they take their appropriate legal action and then there's a suit against the town, the selectmen mm. then have the right, you know, to settle the suit mm. in favor of the town. But I think that there has to be that defined separation in my view, right. based on the way the chat is written. Right. You know, I may not agree with it, I may agree with it, but the point mm. being is that's what the charter says, so I think we have to adhere to it. And I think the other, it, it fits in line with the process for collective bargaining. If there, if there's a grievance that's filed, it's filed with the department head, uh, same action here, same parallel action, but it, and if the, if it doesn't resolve itself at the department head level, then it goes to um, the town manager. The town manager makes a decision, either settles it or it, it's not settled, and at that point it goes to arbitration and mediation. Yeah. So it's more of a legal process than it is a, an appointed or a board of selectmen process. The board doesn't hear 
um, those types of uh, issues. So thank you. I think you've answered the question. So simply yeah. said, if, if it goes to a legal process, if, if the individual is not. It depends what their grievance is. You know, really, well, if, it if, you, you know, it would, well, it, it would, I think it would depend on if it was some sort of violence in the workplace or something like that. If it would still be a depart, uh, a department head issue, a board of, uh, and a town manager. Yeah, issue. I was thinking uh, like, a, like, a, like a, a termination or something select. like that. You, you've answered my question. That, that's yeah. good. Thanks. The only person we have the right to hire and fire, Tom, is the town manager under the form of government we have now. So. All right. A motion to close the hearing? So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, the hearing is closed. I did have a couple more questions on it, John. Sure. Just a couple of typos. On page six, are you deleting counsel and agent from? I'm sorry. Okay, where? Where do you see under, under department heads on page six? Um, okay, department heads. Is, I have it as page five. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. But it looks as though it's council on it's got council on aging, and then it says deleted on my copy at least on the side. It's supposed to be director, isn't director it? Director of council on council on aging, director. Or are you just adding director, the word director, into that? I'm adding director. <coughs> so um, it'll say director of council on aging. Is that it's it? actually deputy director. Uh, oh, deputy assessor. Is it? Let me see. Hang on a second. Actually, it looks as though it's. Um, it should be deputy. I don't think it's um, in the right place. Okay. Uh, do you want? Uh, um, well, you should just clean. It that should be up. Council on Aging Director. Director. So you want to add the word director, basically, is what you're doing. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Not yet. Um, five two C. Bingo. Okay. And then there's a numbers one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, one, two. That last three. sentence, the formation of a merit-based system shall be developed by the personnel board and reviewed by the board of selectmen. That should probably be changed, right? To the town manager. Or shall be developed by the personnel board and the town manager, I guess. The town man manager and uh, the and review reviewed by the. Uh, well, it, it's also uh, denial of merit pay does not necessarily count kind of less than satisfactory service to, to be eligible for a merit pay. It is expected that the employee's uh, performance at higher. You might want to also add. Here, um, the formation of a merit system shall be developed by the town manager in consultation with um, uh, with with the appropriate appointing authority. Okay. Then on five dash four. And reviewed by the personnel board. Excuse me. Five dash four B. Okay. Uh, one, two. That third sentence. In the event of a dispute, the board of selectmen shall have the final authority. That has to do with overtime pay, so that that shouldn't that don't be there. Okay, I put town manager. I don't know if um, the elected boards want to get involved in a no. dispute. Right, that's the point. Employees. Yeah, it shouldn't be there. Right. right. Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. Um, six dash two A. Yep. That last sentence, if it is determined that a new job description is necessary or that changes to the existing job description are required, the appointing authority will be responsible for preparing the new amended job description and for submittal to the personnel board. Shouldn't that, I would think, to the town manager? Um, one of the things that I would like to try to establish with the personnel board is that they, that they have some oversight and a check on the balance in some respects. So if we do a submittal um, by the town manager, um, if, it, if we're amending a job description it, uh, it, and it's submitted to the town manager with approval by the uh, personnel board, because we're, we're working trying to work together right. on those things. So, But I think you should, the town manager's position should be mentioned in there somewhere right now. Yeah, it, well, right now. So then we'll say that the, the appointing authority will be responsible for preparing, um, well, I don't know if it's the appointing, well, the appointing authority could prepare a, um, in the case that the library trustees or that, for that matter, the water and sewer commissioners uh, but it should, should be submitted to town manager, um, and then it would be discussed and by the town manager with the personnel board. And reviewed with the personnel board. Yeah, okay. okay. Dash two, letter E. D? E, like in okay. Eric. Yep. Uh, there's still a reference in there to executive secretary. Oh, I thought I removed it. Okay. Let's just keep it in there so we have something to discuss at town meeting. <laughs> Well, actually, um, maybe we need to, it's meant to be, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. That's all I have. Okay, we'll That's make it. those changes and be done with it. Does anybody have any other changes? Do we want to take a vote to accept these as amended? I'll make that motion. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. It's unanimous. Very good. All right. Uh, it, it was my hope to, we have a very lengthy agenda to be followed by an executive session that could go very, could go very late. So I don't want to enter this executive session too late. So what I would propose is uh, we continue on with the open session until 8 o'clock, and then we could um, enter into executive session, and then we can reconvene after executive session for either the purpose of adjourning, or if we have any steam left, maybe we can continue with the open session. Is that okay with everybody? I think that's a good idea. Sure. Okay. All right, next on the agenda, uh, we have a discussion on the proposed amendments to the personnel bylaw. I'm sorry. We have uh, <laughs> not again. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Next to the agenda, it's like another forty-five minutes. Yeah. It's we have a discussion on ambulance billing waiver policy and ambulance fees. And with us is Bill Mergendahl from Pro EMS to discuss that. Chief, Chief, Chief John, at all. Thank you. Hopefully, I can get through this by talking because I'll probably need the ambulance the way I'm coughing at this point. Um, I was asked several months ago to look at the ambulance fees to make sure that we're billing appropriately. And it, it's hopefully tonight I'm going to be able to present to you, along with Mr. William Mergendahl, and I'll explain who he is in a moment, um, a recommendation to change uh, fairly dramatically how we set our fees and what fees we're doing. We're trying to make the ambulance itself more sustainable. We're not going to make a profit. We're not a for-profit company. However, we can probably show you quickly we're actually operating at quite a loss by using the, um, the older system that we still do. Uh, the last time Abington raised, or the Board of Selectmen raised the rates was in 2009. 
And at the time, it was based on what a lot of the neighboring communities were doing. It's called Medi Medicare plus 30%. Uh, at the time, that seemed to be working. Since then, and especially last year, Medicare has taken some drastic changes with how they're reimbursing the insurance payments. And as a result of that, we're losing revenue. Uh, I'd also like to discuss a ambulance billing waiver policy that we really don't have. And I think, I believe I, I sent a time manager in your pack. You may have a, a copy of that. They have it. Okay. Uh, and we'll explain what that is. And last, talk again and hopefully pull the trigger on opting out of the Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, payment contract that we've had for 20 plus years that limits the amount of revenue the town's able to come in. We're guaranteed a certain portion, but it's at a much lower rate. A lot of the communities have opted out of that. There is legislation pending um, that could require the insurance companies to direct pay the uh, patient rather than the caregivers, which would be the town of Abington. Um, I think there was actually movement on that today. In, in looking at the revenues in the ambulance revenues statewide, I noticed there was a large disparity between the North Shore and the South Shore communities. Uh, a, a very wide disparity on that. One of the reasons for that is the next gentleman I'm bringing up. He's the CEO of Pro EMS. His name is Mr. W William Mergendahl. Pro EMS is also the ambulance billing company that we have just contracted with. Uh, it took us a while to get to this point with the RFP and everything, but we have been working with him for just over a month now. Now that his company is established, taking over from the previous company, I wanted to get that process going first before we look into change a lot of the rates and, and some of these changes that we have. Um, Bill, you want to come up? Bill is the expert in the field, quite frankly. I know a little bit, but probably enough to be dangerous. I, I'd rather hand it over to him, who, who's going to explain this more. Thanks, Chief. So, um, frankly, I, I mean, I, I don't really see myself as here to advocate one way or another. That's, that's really for you folks to make the decision. Um, but I've been asked to present some of the facts of where you have been and um, try to make some projections based on the rates that you're charging and, and uh, where you fall in comparison to other communities. Um, I worked up just a very basic sheet here. I think you guys have it. It's titled Abington Ambulance Cost and Billing Data, FY 2011 and 2010. Yeah, that was in the package. It was, okay. Um, so, just roughly, uh, what you're trying to do is set your fee to try to get at least closer to covering the cost of providing the service. And that's what most of the towns that have asked us and uh, uh, other ambulance service billing companies to look at is to try to make projections and see how you can do that. Um, I think what we found is that most towns are looking at all user fees, not just ambulance service, but all user fees trying to match the cost of the providing the service and to the fee that they're working on taking in. So in terms of cost, just a rough projection uh, based on the cost of running the ambulance and the number of transports that you do in Abington, the rough average cost per transport would be about $711 per transport. Right now your current fee structure uh, calls for you to bill $500 per ambulance trip for a basic life support and $600 for an advanced life support. So right off the bat, uh, the way your billing is structured now, you're actually billing far below the cost of what it is for you folks to provide the service. So in, take, in taking a look and also um, talking about what the chief said with the change in the Medicare rates, if you take a look at the, your revenue in fiscal year 2011, you took in $500,000 against um, 1,149 transports, which is $435 per transport. And if you look at FY 2010, you actually brought in more money in that year on less transports. The reason for that was a huge cut in Medicare reimbursement that occurred in, in that 2011 year. So couple things. One, by having, and, and you folks are not the only ones to have done this over the years, but to have tied your ambulance rates to Medicare, you're 
going to be automatically cut every time Medicare cuts you. Um, I, I think that if I were to advocate, I think that is a flawed scheme. I think tying the rates to Medicare is somewhat arbitrary. I think you should look at tying the rates to the cost of providing the service. That's first and foremost. So by being at that spot, you're getting cut completely across the board every time Medicare cuts. And this year, 2012, based on Medicare cuts and changes in the fee schedule, you're being reimbursed the same exact dollar amount. This is not adjusted for inflation or anything else. The same exact dollars as you're being reimbursed in 2004. So you've had eight years of increasing costs and no change in reimbursement from Medicare and Medicaid. And again, saw a pretty dramatic cut last year, which resulted in a significant loss of revenue. The other thing that the way your fee schedule is set up, if you could refer to this section here, what you're, what you're doing here is something that many towns have done, and frankly, it's kind of an issue of that's the way we've always done it, sort of kind of tying it to the Medicare rate. But this vast laundry list of codes and charges have subsequently been eliminated over the years. These codes are actually no longer viable codes for many of your insurance companies. So consequently, you're going to be into, as the years have progressed, you're actually not being reimbursed for these charges because the codes just don't exist anymore for many of the insurance companies. It also leads to difficulties in the technical aspect of billing because when you're sending in outdated codes or codes that don't exist, claims can get rejected that would otherwise be paid. So what we've seen as a best practice that exists all over the country and and more and more here is that folks are bundling all of these charges into an increased base rate. So really what you'd be doing is changing this fairly long list of fees into just fees of base rates based on a level of service and a mileage charge, which simplifies your rates and simplifies your billing process dramatically. Um, now, the other piece that you have is, whoops, sorry, thanks for the assist. This chart right here, this is a chart modeled after Norwell. These are the rates that Norwell charges. Um, and again, the rates aren't uniform all over, but we grab Norwell as your close neighbor to give an, a, a similar example of, of people who have changed their billing policies. And this fee schedule projects out what you would potentially, again, disclaimer, disclaimer, <coughs> disclaimer, but you know we've modeled this based on the best information that we have available now and based on what we would call your payer mix from your previous billing company, which is your ratio of Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurance and people with no insurance whatsoever. And we've modeled those rates based on the Norwell rates and it would get you to $653 net revenue per transport, which doesn't quite get you home to 7-Eleven, but it's a lot closer than where you had been in the previous years at that 450 range. Um, that being said, it also makes sense to adopt a more formal policy as it relates to financial hardship to patients. When you bundle rates, when you incre increase user fees, especially for something like an emergency ambulance service, you want to make sure you have a way to quickly address financial hardships. And the policy in your package is a uniform policy. Um, that addresses that. It's a very simple, straightforward policy that allows folks who claim financial hardship to fill out a form and have that information go in, be considered, and have their bill abated. 
Um, in terms of the Blue Cross contract, it's a very, very controversial issue, but there are a couple of facts, which is when it comes to managed care contracts, which this is, there's usually a trade uh, of volume of patients for a reduced rate. Okay? A doctor contracts with an insurance company and says, oh, the insurance company says, okay, we'll send you all of our patients and you'll take a, we'll give, you know, you'll, we'll pay a discount. And you can't really do that with 911 ambulance service. In this instance, it's very difficult for a managed care contract to apply. The other piece is that you're not contracted with any other insurance company. So it seems to be a bit of an aberration that you're contracted with only one, frankly. And the rates that they're reimbursing, again, are in that $400 to $500 a trip range, which is far below your cost of providing the service. So I know that's a, that's a lot, to, lot of information, but happy to answer any questions. <coughs> on the, uh, who oversees or who would make the final decision on the, the waiver policy for a bill? The abatement. the abatement. Well, that would be the board. You're, you're gonna. You, I would recommend that you would set a policy, and by policy, if folks complete the hardship waiver form and attest to the fact that they have no insurance and they don't have money, or they've been vetted, vetted by the fact that they have a, maybe a tax abatement or they're already been vetted and put on free care, health safety net. Those are things that require people to be vetted pretty significantly and would really automatically indicate a hardship. So it would be this board? Well, I, I, would, I would suggest that this board set the policy. <coughs> okay. But by virtue of the policy, you would pick off the individual cases okay. as they come along. What it, in some communities, they, they, they leave that so that the board does not meet, you know, collectively on who gets abated, that it would be a decision by the um, Fire chief that he some towns do that, that as well. Decision. That's true. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Okay, you know the people of the town better than in most cases you know who's who you're servicing more often than others. The board, you know, would really not be detached from that kind of information. And since you would have it and your staff would have it, you would probably be the best, most suited person to make that decision as to who would get abated. And sure. it would be even quicker. Because you could do it with um, nope, that's true. PMS. Or? But there'd be a set of criteria. What is your Absolutely. Oh, the chief oh, would have yeah. to make that determination. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be a judgment as much as no, we exactly. just make sure that it is. There shouldn't be a lot of discretion. I, I don't want to have pick one feeling against another. So. Right. right. That's one of the reasons for having a, a, a more definitive policy. Yes. That you don't end up in that situation, frankly. Right now, and no. and you, you, the last thing you want to do is discourage people from calling 911. That is paramount to what we're talking about here, especially when it comes to the financial hardship policy. And you do not want to set up a situation where people are literally, literally afraid to call 911 because of the fee. Well, that, just to, John, do you think that's a, an issue now? It, it can't be Under right now. Present, in present policy. Present policy, there is none. Okay. So basically, anybody that's requested a waiver of the fee gets it because I'm not going to pick one family over another. Okay, and just when you started your presentation, you spoke a little bit about insurance companies now not reimbursing the provider, but reimbursing the patient, and then, is, is that where you were going with that? No, that would be more opting out of the Blue Cross Blue Shield contract. You, wanted, you said there was some there, there's that today, actually? Some insurance companies have, have started reimbursing the patient directly, right. paying the patient directly for non-contracted ambulance service in, in an effort to force non-contracted ambulances to contract with them at a lower rate. And there's legislation on Beacon Hill right now. That's criminal. <laughs> well, that, you said that, Mr. Manager. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's a very difficult policy. The insurance company has implemented to try to uh, force that. There's legislation now uh, that applies to emergency ambulance service only that would require the insurance companies to pay all providers directly for that service. At a rate, at a rate that's set by each individual town. Mr. Mergendahl, do you currently have a contract with the town of Abington? Uh, we do. We've been billing for you for one month now. Okay. And what is, in, in terms of your costs, is that built into each individual bill, or is that 
Uh, how, how was your cost derived from? We we collect four percent of all revenue collected, which is very standard. Thank you. Yep. Go ahead, Ken. I understand most of this. I, I'm just confused at the, at the cancellation of Blue Cross provider contract. I'm not sure what that means. It, it means that the town has a contract with Blue Cross now to provide us with with what? You have a contract with Blue Cross now as a con you're a contracted ambulance service with Blue Cross right now. What, what does that mean? And that means that you actually accept uh, a lower contracted rate from Blue Cross and they pay you directly. Okay, and you're suggesting that we eliminate that? Um, I, like I said, I don't think I want to advocate either way, but I, I, I can give you the facts. Okay. Which are that the vast majority of emergency ambulance service providers are not contracted, that they reimburse far below what it costs you to provide the service. So we would still bill Blue Cross, but we would receive more money from them if we're not contracted? Based on current payer policy, that's right. Okay. I can jump in just for a second. Basically, what that Blue Cross Blue Shield contract is, and it's a, it is confusing. I think this most of the area towns uh, throughout the state got a letter about 20, 25 years ago from Blue Cross saying we're going to guarantee we're going to pay your bills. Just sign here. Most fire chiefs at the time did that. Um, they guarantee payment, but it's at a much lower rate. Instead of getting 100 percent of the bill, they're guaranteeing you're getting paid maybe 40 percent, 60 percent. Um, the savings for the town by getting out of this could be anywhere from forty to seventy thousand dollars annually. That that number fluctuates depending on it, but that's that's one of the main reasons for that. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense. Um, and, and again, so, it's not a matter of of you know driving up the cost. It's a matter of trying to cover the cost of providing the service. Frankly, <laughs> if we were to break this contract with with Blue Cross Blue Shield, what what step would we have to take? Uh, usually, these contracts involve a 90-day notice. About half the towns have already done it. Mm -hmm. um, I got all the stuff ready to do it. I, I know the process. Just kind of waiting for the uh, waiting to see what's happening up at Beacon Hill to see where this could be going. This, this where is it going? Does anyone know? Could sit for six more years and limbo the way it is now. But they are getting closer to. If, if this, if, if the insurance companies ever were able to carry out the threat of paying the patient directly instead of the municipalities, not only would that affect the revenue side for the fire department or all the fire departments that run the ambulance, it's also going to affect how busy we are. Because mm -hmm. if the average person finds out, if you're out in the street and you claim chest pain or whatever it is, and you, you take paid. it to the hospital, the next thing you know, you get a $3,000 check in the mail. Mm -hmm. Do you know how many of those we're going to get? Mm -hmm. It's going to put us out of business, mm -hmm. and we're not going to get paid for it. it. I think the state sees it. I think they're seeing the ludicrous of it. Uh, of the threat, so that, that's why I, I'm comfortable that there should be some protection, hopefully moving afoot to prevent this from happening. Breaking this, con I'm sorry, breaking this contract with Blue Cross would not affect any residents in Abington in any way. They'd still get the ambulance service. It'd just be how we get billed, Correct. basically. I wanted to, my, when I heard about this, I, I was very much in favor of looking to break the contract because it, it, it's financially disadvantage, it disadvantages the town at, at the expense or the added revenue um, to an insurance company. I mean, it's like we are subsidizing each run that's paid for by Blue Cross and Blue. We're subsidizing, the taxpayers are subsidizing a portion of that run. Andy. So these rates, these projected rates, are these are what you're projecting, Chief, or are these just? I can work on the figures together. These are, I think we agree on these figures. This, this is a Based on the amount of runs we have done, based on increasing the rates that, that we have now, uh, we could be bringing it up to up to seven hundred thousand dollars a year instead of the five hundred. With with this projected rate, these are the rates that you would project. I, I think it's this yes. page here. No, yeah, that's, that's, that's actually those are the old rates. That's the one we're operating under. Now. No, but it says recommended fee increase. Yeah, two thousand nine. So that's, 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 that's the last time we increased. That was two thousand nine. Oh, this is based on the town of Novell just did this. Uh, and that's why we're using they're one of the South Shore communities yeah. uh, based on the same rate. So yes, it would be based on, on this sheet if that's what you're talking about, correct? Okay. Is this something that the board feels comfortable taking action tonight or do we want to table this? I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable. Okay, would somebody like to make a motion? I'll make I'll make the motion to uh, approve this sheet here, what the pool has, and then 
to also improve the willing billing waiver policy going forward. Understand we have to make a uh, you know decision on how that's going to be set forth, a policy on that. Can can we hold off on the on that just? I have a cup on the billing policy. Can we do it separately? Because I do have a couple of questions. Fine. That's fine. I'll, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll amend my motion to just uh, the approval of the new rates as suggested by Chief Hutto. No. Okay. Second. Good. Second. Now, does that, that motion doesn't include breaking the contract with Blue Cross Blue Shield? It does. Okay. It, I, I believe it would have to. Is that correct, Bill? Yeah. Um, it, it does not have to, no. Well, yes. But, it, 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 it wouldn't make okay. any sense. If, 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 if the Chief is, if that's his, you know, suggestion to do that, yes. I okay. Make that motion. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. That's unanimous. Okay. Andy? Just on the procedures here. Um, the hard chip waiver form can be requested by contacting Pro EMS. That's us, the billing service. Right. That's where I got confused. Completed form should be forwarded to Pro EMS Solutions. And Pro EMS Solutions will review the form, but I thought you thought that that was something that the chief or the board should do. Is that is a that's a model policy. Okay, that so other, we shouldn't be doing. We, we should. That's a model policy that other communities have adopted. Um, some communities have wanted the chief to remain involved. Many others have not. If if you were to review the form, would you charge us more, or is still no. included in the four percent? Still the four percent. You would review the form and then rec make your recommendation to the chief. So yes, based on the policy. I, I, I think I'm comfortable with that, only that it gives you an arm's length to express concern if you know the individual. I think it should be based on a set of criteria. It's better to have a third party review it, and then if they feel it, deem it fitting and proper, then recommend to the chief, you know, bill number XX doesn't even have to be a name. Bill number XX meets the criteria. We recommend abatement thereof. I, I, I think it's important to have some flexibility in a policy. In other words, it, it would, um, and, and that's what we have there. If we receive, I would suggest that a hand scrawled note from an 80 odd year old patient, I think it would be very difficult to try to force them into completing the form. That's where we need that bit of flexibility. That's fine. You know, and I, that's that's why the policy is created as it's as it is. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Chief. You're good. You're good. Yeah. Just so, but shouldn't we put some criteria with this? There's no criteria in this as to. Uh, actually, I'm sorry. That's on the form itself. Okay. And the the criteria that we've used um, in the past is um, an attestation, frankly, of hardship. And ways that that can be vetted is if someone's already on health safety net, which is free care, which means they've been vetted by the state. If they have a property tax abatement. Um, can we get a copy of that form? Sure. Can we put this on until the next Five time minutes. so we can take go look and make sure that yep. we're all That's fine. knowing what we're doing here as far as the criteria goes? Yep. But again, I, I want to reemphasize that. You don't want to make the criteria so hard and fast. No, that I just want to see what it is. I understand before I that we're it. creating a situation that you probably don't want to create. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Okay, great. So, would have so Andy, when would you want to have the next chief meetings. back next meeting? Yeah, I'm not sure you even have to come back, Bill. I'm okay, yeah, it's just, this is just to discuss the criteria for the yeah. abatement. Okay, thank you, Bill. You're thank welcome, you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on. These next uh, four action discussion items are going to go pretty quick. So let's just. Get them taken care of. Use <laughs> now, uh, approval of the minutes for February 27th executive session. So moved. Okay, second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Okay, uh, four uh, yes and one opposed. I was not there. Not opposed, I'm sorry, abstain. Uh, February 27th open session minutes. So moved. Second. second that one. Okay, all in favor? Aye. All right. Okay, it's unanimous. What is that, 5-0? Five, 5-0 five zero? Five zero for open session. For the 27th, I, uh, I w that was a five-minute meeting that I missed. Okay. <laughs> uh, num uh, next on the agenda, accept the resignation of Christine Yardley and Richard Yardley from the Conservation Committee. Move we accept with regret and extend our uh, thanks for their years of service. Okay, a letter. Uh, <coughs> second. second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Can you also post those two, John? Mm -hmm. for, uh, Okay, next, appoint the Abington Zoning Board of Appeals representative to the South Shore Tri-Town Development Corporation 
the zoning board of appeals. Just for the record, I didn't Sure. Myself. Okay, Kevin. Uh, let's see. Did we have we had a recommendation from the ZBA? Is that where is that? Board Selector James Haney as its representative to South Shore Tri Tri Town Development. Okay. Is that in form of motion? Yes. Okay. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? What, 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 what? I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kevin. Was it? Wasn't he an, an associate member and they asked for him to be a full voting yeah, member? Yeah, but that, I'm not, I didn't make that motion. I only made yeah, it. So he can be an associate and still be a representative? He's still a member. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It, right. it, the criteria doesn't yep. say that it has to be a full okay. member That's to be first. an associate member. Okay. I know you're in a hurry. Sorry to interrupt you. No, 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 no. I got, because there's something else. There's two parts of that. All in favor of that aye. motion? Aye. Aye. Okay. Kevin abstains. Uh, also, on, on this, it's not on the agenda, but the. No, they've it's not on the yours. My it, failing is not on the agenda. We should do. Okay. Yeah, we, I'm yeah. going to say it again. We've adopted a policy on how we're supposed to make appointments to committees. We okay. Should follow the policy. Okay. And I know fine. they have a recommendation, which is fine, but we still should mm -hmm. adhere to the policy. That's fine. That we adopted. So maybe next meeting, um, Nancy, they're looking for a, 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 a permanent member to replace Ed Mulligan. And we should probably get that in the next meeting so they can go on with their business. Okay. Well, the we'll fill out the, the. Well, the policy is to post it so post people it. can apply okay. for it. And mm -hmm. But that's not for the board. That's just yes, that. Yes. That's for the. That's for the permanent. The. Uh, not for the alternate member or voting member. Well, well it's well, for a, a new voting member to the. A new voting member doesn't necessarily have to come from the alternate membership. It can come from. That's okay. Correct. We'll discuss it next meeting. But I think it should be posted. Just I will, I will post policy. Let's follow policy. Because either way, there'll be an opening as an associate correct. or. or yeah. We'll, we'll yeah. post both of them. Great. Just why don't, why don't we post it? Yeah. Both of them. Okay. All right. Next, setting the hours of the town election, April 28th. Mr. Chairman, I move that we set the hours of the uh, town election for Saturday, April 28th from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. So okay. As recommended by the town clerk. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Now, I don't think we're going to have time for anything else except for public comment. Would everybody, anybody like to say anything? Well, wait a minute. I don't, they need us to set the warrant to have it posted. So I think very simply, okay. if that's all right, I'm going to be very, very quick here. I think in terms of the special town meeting article, I would move that we, and I realize some of this language probably has to be worked on. Um, on the oh, special okay. town meeting, I move that we set the special town meeting for Monday, April 2nd at 7 p.m. at Abington High School and to include the articles 1 through 5 as delineated on our packet. It's 1 through 6. There is a new article I needed to talk to you about that was added. That's fine. 1 through 6. Um, but we are removing Article 2 and the special. What is Article 6? Uh, uh, transfer uh, 774398, salary line item 2205-5110. Okay, uh, yeah, okay, and just on some of those articles, John, I know that it says vote to transfer, but it doesn't say from where, and I think it was an article later raising appropriate on the special. Yeah, we're going to fix, we're to gonna be, fix yeah, that language. Yeah, that language. <laughs> yeah, that's my motion. Okay, Kevin has a motion. What are we doing now? Say that again. We're setting the special town meeting for 7 o'clock. Which is the same time as the annual. The articles, we're not voting on the articles, we're just... When would we do that? Could we do, Well, we have to get the financial picture first. We're Could just setting the warrant so they can go ahead and post it, so we can have time in it. So what, once, once it printed, one, though. Once it's set, that no articles can be removed. You know what? We should probably hold a special meeting uh, just for the warrant piece at some point. Between uh, now and Because typically, don't Monday. we review I mean, the articles and have some... Public well, see what's on, see what's off. That's what you Yeah, but you, yeah. I think Nancy said this has to go to the printer, Nancy, by Wednesday, right? Okay. This this coming Wednesday? Yes. Has the Finance Committee started looking at the draft yet? And yes, they have. How far along are they in that process? I have no idea. Okay. Yeah, All right. Kevin has a motion. I think we're kind of forced into doing it. For the special, right? Well, if you want to have town meeting, you do. Yeah. <laughs> we, can, we can go into the executive session and come out and... Talk about them more. I, I would like to do that. <laughs> I know. Is, is there a motion and a second for the special? There's a motion and a second on the floor. And, and a I, second. I didn't make a second. Okay. 
You made the second? I did. I'll make the second if there's no second for special. Okay. Any further discussion? Well, the motion was for both. No, it wasn't. Oh, it wasn't. It was not. It was okay. just special. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Now I'm going to make a motion to hold the annual town meeting on Monday, April 2nd at 7.05, only because uh, because there's so few articles on the special, I don't, my thought process is that we're not going to hold everybody up if in the unlikely but hopeful event that we finish before 7.30, so that just for legal purposes allows us to go right into the annual town meeting, and I would move the articles 1 through 20 as presented uh, by the town manager. No second. We can, um, if we're not comfortable, we can put this off sometime before next Monday. No, no, no. no. It's about oh, oh, we set the okay. You, you know, Once it's let's, let's put it. This I know way. Kenny had some concerns about some so, articles. Well, then tonight's the night to talk about right. it, or we don't have town meeting. One mm. of the two. Right. So, so we'll about it's as simple as that. After executive session, we'll talk about it. I thought we had. I thought we had until. I'm sorry. I thought we had until Monday to set it. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, we have a second. I'd definitely like to uh, second the motion. Um, I, I, I do have a couple questions I'd like to ask. I don't want to hold the school committee up, and it's my opinion that what we have in front of us in the executive session right now weighs anything we have. In front I think of we can clear up the questions right after the executive yeah. session. It's not going to take long. Well, the executive session might take long, but well, depends on how fast we talk. <laughs> okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Now, next, <clears throat> I want to entertain a motion to enter into executive session for the purposes of discussing the PEC 150E counteroffer, possible settlement of the Howell litigation, and the formation of a new employee organization, and, and, to, convene. and to convene and to back into open and, and, to, and reconvene for the purposes of an open session, an open session or adjourning. So moved. Second. All in favor? Roll call. Roll call. Yes. 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 Yes.